Formula One. Five Lives Checkered Flag Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Checkered Flag Podcast ahead of the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix this weekend, the second round of the 2023 Formula One World Championship. I'm Jack Nichols, and I'm joined for the next half hour or whatever with uh, Andrew Benson, the BBC's chief F1 writer, Jolian Palmer, the former Renault F1 driver, as we look ahead to... Well, the big question, will it be another Red Bull dominant weekend after they wipe the floor with everyone in Bahrain? Max Verstappen leading the championship, and it was a very comfortable day for him in the desert. Still in the desert, uh, now in the west coast of Saudi Arabia, and we'll get on to sort of racing in Saudi and, and things like that a, a little later on. But, Jolian, the circuit itself has become an instant classic. Uh, kind of, hasn't it? Because it's, well, it's the fastest street circuit in the world. And that's what it branded itself as when it came on the calendar a couple of years ago. Um, and it's basically just really hairy. It's a really, <laughs> really sketchily fast circuit. A lot of blind corners and swerves. Um, and we've had a couple of fantastic Grand Prix, it has to be said, around around the track. We had the iconic Hamilton Verstappen, the the penultimate round of 2021, where they collided and they had numerous changes of position, most of them controversial. And then we had a, a, another epic, actually, with uh, Verstappen and Leclerc this time last year. And Verstappen won it in the end, but it was a race-long duel between the two. So it's hairy, but it provides some thrilling racing. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, what are we expecting coming into this weekend? There's a lot of talk that maybe Ferrari will be closer and this will suit them a little bit more. Red Bull won't be quite as strong. But are we all sort of living in hope a little bit still or is there or is there a reality to that well i saw adrian newey actually the rebel chief technical officer at the uh the, as a, at a film premiere the other night and uh i was like can't believe you've done it again adrian he was like oh yeah, i'm sure it's not going to be as simple as everybody thinks it's going to be and i said to him well look adrian when you're a second lap faster than everybody else in the first race of the season it doesn't normally change that much um, I think there are reasons to believe that um, the others might be a bit closer. The Ferrari's problem in Bahrain was tyre degradation. There should be less tyre degradation in Saudi just because of the nature of the circuit. Um, the Ferrari was quick in a straight line in Bahrain, um, which should help it in Jeddah because it's a high-speed circuit. Red Bull's big strength was in the slow and medium-speed corners. There are less of those in um, Saudi Arabia. But come on. Let's not kid ourselves. Um, the Red Bull was so far ahead of everybody else in, in race pace in Bahrain. It's really hard to see how that won't be the case again this weekend, but maybe it won't. Let's wait and see. We're not just going to gloss over the fact that Benson's been rubbing shoulders with the rich and famous at film premieres, are we? It was quite, a, <laughs> it was quite the drop, wasn't it? it wasn't, I was <laughs> expecting, oh, I bumped into an engineer when I was, you know, walking the dog or like, you know, he's doing, changed. He's or changed. I was, yeah, exactly. Or I was getting a new set of spanners from from you know Tool Fix or something. But yeah, no, I mean, look, film premiere. Look, guys, it wasn't Brad Pitt and a Hollywood movie. Okay, it was Villeneuve Peroni. That is uh, a new film, a new documentary film that's been produced by a, a company that Mark Webber works for. And Mark saw me in Bahrain and, and invited me along, along, along with a few hundred other people. I have to admit. In, red um, carpet yeah no, was everyone like Be andrew andrew over here andrew no, like, we're taking pictures very <laughs> much not that no but it was i mean the film what are your is, thoughts on the long runs yeah, <laughs> yeah don't you start palmer um the, it's a terrific film by the way if anybody hasn't seen the tweets that i did about it yesterday and uh thanks to mark weber for inviting me and, and everybody else and um yeah it was nice to see adrian again i haven't had a chat with him for a, a few months Oh, lovely. Well, but are you, are you, Palmer, you were sort of fairly positive going into, into Bahrain. How are you feeling after Bahrain? Positive on, on what the prospect of having a, a good year of Formula One, basically. Um, I'm a positive guy. Bahrain, Bahrain qualifying, we were also positive because I think Red Bull, we, we, we thought Red Bull would be up, up the road, but they were within touching distance of Ferrari. Um, I have to say my positivity is, is, is was waning a little bit for 57 <laughs> laps in, in on Sunday. Uh, the, the thing for me was the ease which Red Bull won the race. Qualifying is one thing. You don't win championships or get points for qualifying. They, they clearly were decent in qualifying. They locked out the front row. But it was the race that was scary, I think. Um, 
the tire deck, as as um, as Andrew says, is is a big thing, and that's where Aston Martin were good and Red Bull were good, and obviously that concept looks like it's working well. Uh, but I mean, how hard was Max even ever pushing in the Grand Prix? I looked at some data after the race; they were lifting coasting from pretty early on. They were they were really not troubled at all. And there was there was a point on some team radio I saw where GPs on the radio being like Max just slow down like we need to do 47 zero I think he was sort of saying and Max just kept pushing but he wasn't on the limit or anything but they were still saying just slow down and you know the other thing with it you know do you know who got fastest lap in Bahrain uh remember so, who someone got someone like they finished eighth was it o- no it wasn't Ocon who was it Joe oh yeah Joe got it in the Alfa Romeo he finished 16th but it just also tells me even we we sort of forgot about it on Sunday, and uh, it just tells me why Red Bull weren't fussed about it. They could have they could have had it. They were they were coasting away to a one two, so many seconds in the bag over Fernando Alonso in third, who was also cruising. If they wanted a fastest lap bonus point, they could have had it. Just click of the fingers, come in for a new set of tires, and bam, complete the hat trick. But it was all just managing pace. Let's not vanish up the road from everyone. And you sort of forgot that bonus point was available. And again, that says to me at this stage, they're not thinking it's going to come down to the wire by they don't need every point they can possibly get. Otherwise, they would have given it a go. Yeah, I mean, look, he was Max was about seven tenths of a second faster than Leclerc on average for the first stint. And then he basically stopped trying after that. Um, he could have won by you know, nearly a minute, I think, over anybody who wasn't in a Red Bull. Um, but, you know, people, it, it is. it was one race on one day on one circuit. It's not the full picture, but it was the, one of the most impressive um, statements I think any team has made at the start of a Formula 1 season for quite some time. Uh, really? It feels like we had a lot of years where Mercedes would turn up and, and just be gone. Or am, am, am I, am I you know wrong in I thinking think that? This is what I, I get quite annoyed about the people comparing the whole what if Red Bull have got a massive advantage this year, how boring is it going to be with the, well, we had seven years of Mercedes domination. There were not seven years of Mercedes domination. There were three years of Mercedes domination in which they had two competitive drivers or mostly competitive drivers with actually a reliability offset, which helped Nico Rosberg against Hamilton. Then you had two years of Ferrari being absolutely competitive and throwing it away. Then you had a year where Ferrari were kind of competitive and got loads of pole positions. Then, okay, Mercedes went back to being dominant again. So, yes, there were race, there were years like 2014. That was like, wow, with Mercedes. And then, of course, you had Braun in 2009 was another wow moment. For me, this was a wow moment like comparable to those sorts of starts of years or McLaren in 98, for example. 2015, Hamilton was 1.5 seconds quicker than the third place car on the grid in qualifying in Melbourne at the season opener. Like, that's a wow. Yeah, exactly. Like 2014 was the same. But yeah. but um, it's been a while since we've had a wow moment, I think. But also with those ones, you had Hamilton and Rosberg. Yeah, that's my so point. You, yeah. So it was, never, there were, it was never felt like a foregone conclusion who was going to win. With Red Bull, we know who's going to win between the two. The the hope really is that if if they're up the road that that Perez can fight with Max and um and we get some sort of battle in a Rosberg Hamilton when they were romping away in fourteen fifteen sixteen that we get some sort of fight because otherwise Verstappen is is clearly the the better driver we've seen it over the last couple of years and he's just gonna win everything basically it's a long season and and the development race can yet change things. Uh, Bahrain is the only circuit we've seen these cars at. So you never know with different tracks, then uh, other characteristics can become apparent. And I think Bahrain was probably flattering Red Bull as well. So I think I don't think it's going to be as bleak a picture as uh, in terms of the competitiveness that, that Bahrain showed. But there is clearly a big gap between Red Bull and the rest to, to start. I think you can you can see just how big Red Bull's advantage is by the reaction you're getting from other teams. You know, we've got, as I said, we've got Hamilton saying they're going to run away with it. Carlos Sainz in the press conference today, the Ferrari driver, um, this comes a day after Fred Vasseur, the Ferrari team boss, 
revealed that Charles Leclerc's got an engine penalty. It's this this weekend. It's the second race of the season. It's just unbelievable. You know, science said we're relatively concerned. It's a bad situation. You know, and then asked about you know, talking about this weekend. He said, "I have the feeling we're going to be a bit more competitive. Is it going to be enough to beat the Red Bulls? Given how competitive they were in Bahrain, it's going to be extremely difficult." So, you know, when you've got the likes of Hamilton and Carlos Sainz talking like that, you, you know that you know they know that they're facing a really difficult season. No Verstappen in Jeddah today, though. He's got a stomach bug. Did you ever pull a sickie on a media day, Palmer? Uh, no, I would have tried, I would have tried, <laughs> but I never could. If you were next to Stappen status, you would have done it, right? Yeah, Yeah, exactly. I was never a two-time world champ. So, um, yeah, I think you do get occasionally drivers, they pull a sickie on a Thursday. And and actually, if you're genuinely not, not 100%, Thursdays are a, are a bit of a bore because... They are still a little bit draining. Speaking to Andrew Benson and the media all the time <laughs> is draining. Um, and this, it's basically a setup day, but it's, you're at the track, you've got the, the spotlight on you, even as you're walking through the paddock, your camera's on you. And it's just, you want to just chill out, get your strength and energy back for what matters, which is tomorrow. Did it, did it change for you, like as you carried on in it, like with the first race in Melbourne in 2016 and you're walking along and all the cameras are following you, are you a bit like, yeah, okay, this is cool. I feel like Andrew Benson at John Wick 4 or or whatever <laughs> with all this attention. Um, but then actually it just gets a bit boring. Did it feel cool to start with? Because that's what everyone, you know, not exactly dreams of about being an F1 driver, but it's a cool part of it. Well, yeah, it's probably with the same with any anything. It's cool the first the first time it happens. When I'm sure when your commentary's dubbed over Drive to Survive and you're becoming <laughs> yeah. an overnight sensation, <laughs> then you're like, oh, I'm on Netflix. That's quite cool. And then by season five, and you're regurgitating the same lines, it's not quite. <laughs> it's not quite there. Well, hang on, were you not interested in the battle for 14? <laughs> were you actually not? The yeah. Gasly arc on scrap. Um, the, the, the big no, I'm surprised that you were. Season. If I'm honest, Jack. But yeah. there we go. I've worked with you long enough. Um, no, it's the same, you know, you, you, the buzz of turning up in Formula One is obviously exciting. We had rookies on the grid last, last time out, three of them that would have felt the buzz of turning up for a first race that first Sunday when the national anthem happens and you get in your car and you're like, wow, this is actually happening. But then you carry on. It's, it's your job then. And you get used to the cameras. You get used to the spotlight a little bit more. It's still there. You, you can't completely ignore it. I don't think, or at least I couldn't completely ignore it, but, um, you just get more used to it, I guess. Yeah. Um, so Ferrari then, well, you mentioned it a moment ago, Andrew, Leclerc having to take a, a grid penalty for a, for a parts change at the second race of the season is, it's a bit, it's a bit nuts, isn't it? And then, you know, okay, you only get two for the year. So if you have one break, then immediately you're going to need one at some point throughout the season. So it's not like they have six engines and they've gone through them all in the first weekend, you know, it was already quite a limited part. So sure, are we it, being too dramatic about well, it? Well, I mean, it was, they're not my words. It was Carl Sainz who said it was a bad <laughs> situation, you know, I mean, and it is a bad situation. I mean, let's be honest. Okay. There are only two, it, this, what we're talking about is the electronic control unit or the, um, the, the, the control electronics, which they call it is a, which is the way they describe it in Formula one for some reason, why they don't call it an electronics control unit. I don't know, but, um, anyway, it's that you only get two for the year. And what happened to Leclerc on Sunday, uh, Vassar said yesterday, was that um, the the first one broke when they fired the car up for the first time on Sunday morning, and then and then they obviously fitted a new one for the race, and that's what caused his retirement, another failure in the same part. So he's had to take a third control electronics unit, electronics control unit. Sorry, and presumably uh, they can't make changes to these units, right? These are the units they've got, so they're putting in a well, thing that's broken <clears throat> twice already in one weekend. That I don't know. They they think they, they they say they're confident that they've got a a fix in place for it, and they say that that fix won't affect performance. So if people were the reason, and the reason Vasso was asked that yesterday was, of course, last year, the reason or one of the reasons Ferrari's competitiveness dropped off in the second half of the year was that after the failures that had basically kiboshed his uh, Leclerc's title challenge. They had to turn the engines down in the races because of uh, they had a reliability problem that they couldn't they basically couldn't fix during last season, 
This, they say, is not the same thing. They can run the engines as normal. Um, I, but what they haven't explained is exactly what, what went wrong in the ECU as to why it would fail like that. So it is it is a bit of a concern. And, you know, when they came into this season, let's not forget, saying they felt they'd got over all their engine problems over the winter. And lo and behold, the first race, they have two, um, even if they were different from last year. So not a great place for Ferrari to be. And I don't remember a situation quite so extreme as this hitting anybody uh, quite so early in a season. And they'll engines. surely they'll surely have another one to take as well at yeah. some point. Then you know they've now got one to do the next twenty races or twenty two races. So they'll surely have another one. And the other thing is it's a ten place grid drop as well. I didn't mention that, but it's a it's a hefty one. Yeah, the first time you take a, a, a sort of a, a, a part over the limit is ten places. The next time it's five. Yeah. The other thing is Leclerc is sh- surely the best place to try and challenge the Red Bulls. Race on race at the moment. If you if you put the championship to one side but turning up who would Red Bull think might be able to scupper them this weekend was well, Leclerc he was the guy that nearly split them in qualifying in Bahrain he's got good form around Jeddah was uh, on the front row last year he was actually was really good the year before with Ferrari as well when they didn't have such a good car he's always been strong in in, in this race and if there's a bit less deg then maybe the Ferrari won't be as exposed in the race and Red Bull maybe would be fearing him well, not when he's starting from at least 10 places back, maybe further back, depending on if they take anything else. So, um, well, they can't take anything else right now, can they? So it's 10 places back, but it's just a nightmare situation for them. And to keep motivated as well, if you're Leclerc, every, with Hamilton speaking, saying that maybe they've gone down the wrong path and Mercedes are having this uh, big overall thought about their concept, they're a bit doom and gloom. And Ferrari now as well, round two, and their lead driver is having a 10 place grid penalty. He's already not scored any points in Bahrain. It's a shocking way to start the year from a just a mentality point of view. How do you think, right, this is our year, let's galvanise the troops? Well, on that, what, what do you make of sort of Fred Vasseur's stuff he's been saying this week? Because, you know, you talk about Leclerc's uh, motivation and, you know, all these stories came out that he'd had chats with the big bosses at Ferrari, but Fred Vasseur has come out and said, no, they're just normal chats. We have them We have them all the time. Vasseur claiming he's never had this much power running a team before. So do we sort of... But, and then there's all sort of rumours or reports of key personnel leaving the team. So it feels like they're in a... a, a I don't know. It, does it feel like they're in disarray, Andrew? I think that's what I'm trying to work out. Or whether actually Vasseur's coming in and sorting stuff out which is going to lead to some uh, changes naturally. Well, he says they're not in disarray, but there were a lot of stories over the week immediately after Bahrain in the Italian media uh, suggesting that they were in various ways. One thing that definitely has happened is a guy called David Sanchez, who was their head of vehicle performance, has left. And uh, it seems he's going to McLaren. Um, he uh, used to work in the past with Andrea Stella, uh, when, who's now the McLaren team principal, but was uh, Fernando Alonso's race engineer at Ferrari back in the day. So they know each other from then. That's definitely happening. The other things that are said to have been happening were that there was some tension between Benedetto Vigna, the uh, Ferrari CEO, and Fred Vasseur, that Leclerc wasn't happy um, and that they'd had a, basically a sort of crisis situation, as they called it. Science was saying today it definitely isn't a crisis situation. They're all motivated and pushing in the right direction and the same t- direction as each other and all the rest of it. And that's what um, Vasseur was saying in the news conference that he had yesterday that I w- was also involved in. Um and he also dismissed any idea of anybody else senior leaving because another person who'd been linked with leaving is Laurent Mekis, who's the racing director, who was basically Binotto's number two last year. And he's also uh, Vasseur's number two now. And Vasseur was saying he's got total confidence in Mekis and, and, and he doesn't expect any other senior personnel to leave this year. But as Jolien says, um, they are in a difficult situation. I think what's been interesting, there's been quite a different change. There's been quite a change of tone in Ferrari's public uh, performances so far this year, um, and it must have come from Vasseur. Binotto was always trying to play everything down, and as we remember last year, denying that there were any problems with strategy when it was plain as, you know, 
parts on a uh, body parts on a dog that there were problems. <laughs> um, <laughs> Is that um, a phrase? I didn't know that was um, a phrase. I've, I've made it more polite, Jack, than the actual no, phrase. No, but I didn't, I didn't know the impolite one. I didn't um, know that was a thing. Vasseur has been basically completely up front. They're holding these pre-race press conferences. They're trying to get get Vasseur to talk to the media more often, being, they're being much more open. And I, I, I can't imagine Sainz saying those words, a bad situation, last year in the way that he's done it to this year. Now... Whether it's a good thing or a bad thing to but be quite, they were quite winning so, this time last year. Well, quite, but you know, even in when they, even when they, what I meant was even when they were in difficult situations, they, they tried to say that they weren't. This year, they've been absolutely upfront about it. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, of course, it's a matter of opinion. But from my point of view, I think it's great to be, that they're being so direct and open and honest about things. But isn't it down to the fact that we we've just had a winter where so end of last year, Red Bull are romping away with it and they win. Verstappen gets the most wins in a season. Everyone then has a winter. They've been working on these cars for some time and they uncover the cars. No one knows what to expect. They're all pleased with their own numbers and they think they're going the right way. And then you get to round one and you're thinking, oh no, we've not, we've not got it right. How then? That's, that's a different situation, I think, to where Ferrari was, were the best team this time last year then, and, and things slipped away, but still they were quite quick and they could have won in Singapore or they could have won in places later on in the season. When you turn up and you've just not made any progress, in fact, you've dropped a lot further back than you were at the end of last year, that's, it's, it's unprecedented for the, for the big teams to have made such a big step back at, at this time. That's what I don't really... Do you, what, I, do, you, do you count Mercedes in that as well? Yeah, and I'm lumping Mercedes with them. Yeah, well, Mercedes what's... more so, to be honest. Mercedes, I mean, they've got to have a huge amount of scrutiny going on. For all the progress they made last year, they have leapt back and they're, they're back to square one with it, which for, for the whole team, you're in a, a well-oiled machine of a Formula One team. And Mercedes, they can win championships. They have maybe the best driver lineup in the field. And yet they spend the energy and the effort of everyone to get that car to a position where it can win a race last season. And then here we go. Here's the big reveal of the new car. And they're just back. What's interesting is that when you look at the comparison numbers from last year to this, Red Bull, Ferrari and Mercedes have all made quite significant steps forward in performance from the, from the, you know, the equivalent race of last year to the equivalent race this year. It's just that Red Bull have made more than anybody else. And, to go back to Adrian Newey, um, I didn't just bring him up to talk about um, cinemas. Um, Why? What do you mean? Well, one of the things... Oh, your he's, premiere. You've brought it yeah, up again. Yeah. One, of the oh, things okay. he's, one of the things he said to me was that these new rules, when he first saw them, he thought, oh, God, these are dreary. There's nothing you can do with them. But then he started to look at them and actually, and he reckons it absolutely wasn't intended by Formula One at all because they were trying to make them prescriptive. He said, actually, there's quite a lot of open things within the rules when you start digging right down lots of places you can exploit um obviously aerodynamically uh, well i did think this last about. year because all the talk about these new cars they're all going to look the same they're all going to be you know carbon copies of each other whatever but then you had the ferrari with its you know big old side pods and then you had the red bull kind of looking fairly normal and then you had the merc with its no side pod like it was they were the most different looking front running F1 cars I feel like I've seen in quite a while, honestly. But I think what's scary about that comment from Newey is, first of all, we've seen the evidence of it already with the progress that they've made from last year's car, which was already brilliant, to this year's car, which seems to be even more brilliant compared to the rest, to, compared to the, rest of the field. But if he's talking about you know lots of avenues to explore and lots of potential within the rules, where are they going to go with it? You know, how much further can they go? That That's the for everybody else or for anybody who wants, you know, close competition between different teams. That's got to be like, that's got to be a slight oh my God moment, you know. Vasseur did say yesterday, didn't he, that they feel like they've got a lot of, you know, things they can exploit and a lot of sort of, it didn't, didn't quite say easy wins, but that sort of insinuation that there was, you know, they Ferrari feel like they've got quite a bit of time on the table kind of, pretty yeah. ready to go they're in a different place from mercedes they think they they've got a whole lot of developments planned and they're all coming in they've got a new parts in Jeddah this weekend they've got new parts in australia for the race after that so they can see a plan where they can they definitely know this performance coming to the car the wind tunnels correlating to the track and they haven't made as much progress as red bull but they can see how they can move forward from here 
Mercedes are in a completely different situation where Toto Wolff, the team boss, has basically just gone, we've got it wrong and we need to start again with a different concept. Now, of course, you can't just do a different concept like that, snapping your fingers after the first race because to conceptually change your car, it takes months, you're talking about a year away. But what their problem is, well, while they're thinking, oh my, oh my goodness, what do we do now when we've gone the wrong way? They don't have a clear path forward, whereas Ferrari do. And by the way, people we haven't even talked about yet, Aston Martin, Fernando Alonso is already saying this is only the beginning for this car. We've got a load of things planned to move it forward. And just to mention on that, McLaren. Now, McLaren are, are looking pretty bad right now, but they basically, but by all accounts, they had this eureka moment that Mercedes are having now. They had it in the winter where they were developing on their path and then they got to a point and they, then they thought, oh no. We have to go down this path, presumably more in the Red Bull direction. It's floor edge they're talking about, Jolien, actually, more than side pods in their case. The, you know, the, that sort of section along the edge of the floor, which seals the, the gap between the floor and the, and the track. But carry on, sorry. But they've still, they've still halted their development to change the direction on it with a view to, in three or four races' time, unveiling their, their new concept idea on the floor edge then. And... Um, and they, they basically saw the light early and they're taking, they're not early enough, they're taking some short-term pain now, but then they want to open up a whole new development path later on. And that's probably something that Mercedes are going to have to look to, to do as well if they're thinking they're going to have to change their whole concept. Ah, uh, okay, this is... Bear with me because this is a stretch. Have Red Bull made the best cars in Formula One since 2010. Like every year since 2010, they've actually been the best team at making cars. You know where I'm coming from, right? Because of yeah, the Honda yeah, we, engine well, I, and I the Renault we do, engine. We don't, we don't know is the answer. But did we, did, we, did we underestimate them in the Mercedes years of what they were actually doing, considering now they have a powertrain of what, you know, that is competitive, they're suddenly destroying everyone again? It's impossible to know the answer. I think um, what's, it's clear that they always had a good car. I think if I had to guess, I would say that there were times when their car was not as good as the Mercedes. Um, for example, look at, look at how much their car changed in competitiveness from 20 to 2020 to 2021 just by the, uh, the back end of the floor being cut off in that what they called the cheese slice and how much Mercedes went back. Uh, it was more Mercedes going back than Rebel going forward there. I think Mercedes did have an absolutely excellent car concept when they went from 2017 onwards, when they went for that longer car. Um, but I'm sure Red Bull were, were always there or thereabouts, but you just weren't able to really tell. That Renault engine they had at the start of the hybrid era was so bad. Yeah. And there, we, we know the, the fallout from Red Bull and Renault and the Honda switch and everything. But I, I drove with the Mercedes engine at Lotus and then Renault came back into the, to Formula One. So we put the Renault engine into a Lotus car. And my God, there was a terrible difference. <laughs> really? It was that we just line, Honestly, the car didn't change. It was, this, is on, this is on the simulator. But the car didn't change. And we just say, okay, these are the power, they, the, the power numbers coming out of Renault. And it was like, pfft, nothing. Give us nothing. a number, Jolien. What was the, the, what was the lap time deficit? Uh, I, oh, it could, it could be over a second. Yeah. I mean, it was huge. And this was 2016. Yeah. So, uh, and you feel it on the straights. I mean, you you got suddenly no oomph. And this was peak Mercedes in that in that 14, 15, 16 era compared to the Red Bull in their struggling time. But a huge amount of that would have been on the on the power unit at Renault. So Mercedes then. Lewis Hamilton told us after the race in Bahrain, told Rosanna, um, you know, the team kind of didn't listen to me. Was his I was going to say inference, but it's just exactly what he said. And um, he kind of rode back a little on that today, Andrew. Well, funnily enough, he well, kind he of did tried. And then, he, then he went forward. He again. Kind of, yeah, he tried to kind of tried to row back on it, and then basically didn't because he was asked about it, and he said, in hindsight, it wasn't the best choice of words. But then immediately he said, there are times when you're not in agreement with certain team members. But what's important is we continue to communicate, etc. 100% belief and blah blah blah. Um, so he he kind of I think what he was trying to say really was I wish I hadn't said it in that way because it caused quite a storm when it came out that story. Obviously, it was quite you don't very often hear people say that about their teams. Um, 
And I think lots of people would have thought it was a bit, really a bit naughty of Hamilton. Lots of people in Formula One, I mean, as other team members looking at that from the outside would have thought he really shouldn't be saying that sort of thing about a team that's given him six out of his seven world championships and a dominant car for so long. But anyway... Well, so we it, want to hear him toe the PR line. Well, that's, that's what we them all want. saying it from the perspective of a team member. Of course, he's just telling the truth, presumably, because he obviously feels he wasn't listened to. It seems the implication is that he wanted them to change the car and he felt that the, the way the car is, you know, the, the concept, it's not just about the side pods, by the way. It's a whole load of other things that drive... The drivers sit further forward in the Mercedes than the Red Bull drivers do, and that has an effect on the side impact structure, and the, and that's how, what led them to the side pod design. And so, the driver being further forward, there's a different gap between the front wheels and where the start of the side pod would be, and so on and so on and so on. So it's not, it's quite a complicated situation. That's what I meant by they cut earlier when I said they can't just change it overnight. But he, I guess, he felt that they should have realised earlier that this was the wrong path they were on. Um, and it was interesting to hear Toto Wolff in Bahrain just say so quickly after qualifying, we got it wrong, we need to change path. He must have been preparing to say that already, uh, in which case you have to ask yourself, well, if they thought that earlier, which they obviously did, why didn't they do something about it? But anyway. It's, 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 it's an interesting one. Were you, were you surprised with those comments, Jolian, from Hamilton? Or he's a seven-time <gasps> champ, he's allowed to say that he, dis- he thinks the team went the wrong direction in a car that's not good. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't mind him for saying it. I think it's it's frustrating when you're a driver. You're a seven time champ. Um, he's not an engineer, though, right? If you give Hamilton no, no, a, so a, I'm not a, saying an easel right. and, a, and a pencil, you can't yeah. expect him to design the car. There's two things. I'm not saying that he's he's right to say that, um, or, or that he's right with his notion that they had to change the car because he's not he's he's not an engineer. He's not a aerodynamicist, and so they will have an understanding of exactly the pathways that they've had to make that car and they've made it for reasons that will be very, very good and probably better than any anyone can uh, postulate, even just for, even from sitting in the car. You can't work out what your alternative realities are like, can you? So um, it's tricky to say, absolutely, this is, this, is, this is wrong. But I also can just see the frustration from Lewis and from many of the drivers out there at the moment uh, again, it's back to this whole, we've had a winter off, we're trying to make progress with the car, and then and I've trusted you all this way, and we they made the progress, and Russell had the win last year, and then they've just fallen back again. And everything is almost like everything they were hoping for has just fallen away from them, and they, they, they've got to hope for it again and work f- back towards what they were doing again. And when you're looking at uh, Hamilton, seven-time world champ, not getting any younger. He's probably thinking, you know, it, the frustration I think is is there. He needs to be fighting for championships again. Is his talent always going to be good enough to to do that in the future? Well, it's not always going to be, but for how long more will he be able to in the right car, especially with Russell there? There's there's a lot of questions and he hasn't got time on his side to wait anymore. Yeah, Tom Clarkson asked him today actually in the press conference. Um he was saying you know, what's your motivation like? And are you thinking of moving to another team? And, uh, and he said, no motivation, you know, you just have to, what what did he say? Channel your motivation in sort of different areas. And, you know, he's been with Mercedes, there is family, so it's fine. So there was none of that going on, but you do wonder in that whole, because there is currently the talk, isn't there, of the, you know, new Hamilton deal that's kind of looming-ish conversations, maybe we'll start or whatever, but if you're, you are going to lose a bit of faith, aren't you, Andrew, in the in the team right now? Well, he's surely he very demonstrably has lost faith. Well, the, he was already they were already being asked these questions in Bahrain uh, two weeks ago. You know, th- when it was obvious the Mercedes wasn't competitive, people were already asking about his contract, and he said then, "No, I intend to stay. I'm not going anywhere." And he said it again today. I'm not. You know, I can't see myself going anywhere else. This, by the way, was one thing. One of the things I forgot to mention about Ferrari was the other thing that was going around in Italy was Leclerc going to Mercedes instead of being at Ferrari. But both, um, which is something that sort of began to emerge last year. Um, And actually, if you were looking for, if you were Mercedes and you were looking for a driver, if you thought Hamilton was leaving, then obviously Leclerc would be your obvious choice. Um, But both Hamilton and Toto Wolff have been absolutely clear that they are, that they 
they, there's no doubt that there will be a new contract. That, that, that's what that's what they say. And um, well, where else would he go? That's the thing. He, he hasn't got. He's 38. He's not going to win the title surely this year or next year. Surely, like surely, then, you know, surely then, we're getting to the point to now 40. where then you're this is what to I'm. 40. This is what I'm go saying. Go for I'm, a last hurrah. Jump uh, in the other Red Bull. I'm not saying and go take somewhere Verstappen else. on in his own team. I'm not saying go somewhere else. But I think aren't we getting to the point now where if we're talking about this whole change of concept and you can't just change your concept, he's not winning next year either. So then, you know, what are we doing here? Racing or ping pong? Win or bust? Move to Red Bull? <laughs> yeah. He, he won't move. Look, I, I don't know him that well, but he's, he's, abs- he's, he's been absolutely consistent um, through the last few years. Whenever anybody's asked him about moving, there's been speculation about Ferrari. There's been, there hasn't been speculation about Red Bull until now, although obviously there's going to be now. But he's always said the same thing. I've been with Mercedes since I've thir- I'm 13. I'm part of the family. I see my future with Mercedes for long after I'm in Formula One. He sees himself being an ambassador. He sees them working together on diversity and social inclusion and all sorts of things and environmentalism and you know uh, producing zero emission cars. That's how he sees the rest of his life. So I think it's unless he has a massive change of heart, it's hard to see him suddenly going, do you know what, I'm going to throw all that away just so I can go and race against Max Verstappen in a Red Bull for a year? It doesn't make any sense, does it? Oh, it'd be fun, though. <laughs> yeah, that, that, yes, it would be fun. But uh, I, I just, it, it, as long as, if, assuming you're taking him at face value and he's not making it up and I've got no reason to believe that he is, I, it doesn't sound like it's going to happen. No, and I, I, I buy that he'll stay with Mercedes forever, but it's just how long he races in F1 for... Mercedes well, if there's not the opportunity to to win till maybe at least 2026 well again I, rules. again I don't know and I'm not discussed this with him but there was a, not it's not that long ago he was you know when Alonso was coming back and Hamilton was saying I can't see myself racing till I'm 40 yeah but but when I did an interview with Lewis in Austin last year he was asked that exact question you know if you do another contract you are going to be 40 when you're in F1 and he basically he basically said yes um, and so it feels to me like he's had a, a change of mind in the sense that he thought that he saw an end point to his F1 career and it feels like he's now got to a place where he thinks, well, do you know what? I have got all these other projects going on outside, but what I really What's love to do, yeah. what defines me is I am a Formula One driver and yeah. I love it. And he's looked at, he's still performing, he thinks that at his highest level. He's looking at Alonso, who seems to still be performing at something close to what his highest level was, and he's going to be 42 in July. And Hamilton, if why wouldn't he think right now, well, I can carry on for a few more years if that's the case. Yeah. If you start now, a- are we really thinking that for Mercedes, it's going to be 2026 before they can fight? We're just starting 2023. Right, but, okay, we, but 2023, we painted, no chance. 2024, nah, have on. they got any chance? We have painted a bit of a, a bleak picture of, of this season's Formula 1 already, but let's not rule out the next three seasons with it as well, that yeah. Mercedes can't fight, and we obviously are, you're, you're going to be lumping Ferrari in with them as well. Well, one of the interesting things about this season, one of the most interesting things about this season, is everyone talks about, you know, when people talk about teams progressing, it's always, oh, it's, it's incremental, it's going to take time. You, know, you hear about Alpine talking about Alpine are on their second five-year plan. You know, they had a five-year plan when they were Renault, and now they're on another five-year plan. Now. They're part of they the changed five-year teams plan. to justify a new five-year plan. <laughs> yeah, that's how it normally works. But look at Aston Martin. You know, they've got they've done a they've put in a load of investment they haven't even got their new factory and wind tunnel up and running yet and their car overnight has leapt from okay they were making progress towards the end of last year but they've made a quantum leap forward in competitiveness from last year to this and actually what a lot of the teams are looking are saying publicly well do you know what that just proves that you can do it so i think that's that's given a lot of hope to people like mercedes that they can make progress if they if they make a change and I guess we should talk about Aston Martin a bit, Jack, probably. What would you like to say? Well, just, I mean, we're talking about Mercedes and Ferrari and how they can't challenge Red Bull. Are we Are we looking at a new second team in Formula One? I don't know. I mean, Alonso, okay, only qualified fifth in, in uh, Bahrain and he got held up behind the Mercedes after making a bad start. But was his the second fastest race car? Would he have beaten Leclerc on on the track had he been, you know, not had he not lost two places at the start? I don't think we, Perez? 
I don't, yeah, exactly. I don't think we can know that right now, but that is a really interesting live question. How quick can Alonso be in that car in a race where he starts, you know, he starts where he should start and then makes his normal good start, you know? Well, he, he was quicker than Leclerc. Yeah. So he would have beaten Leclerc. I think that's fairly, assuming he didn't get biffed by his teammate and lose those places at the start. In a straight fight, if Alonso's there fourth or fifth, end of lap one, Leclerc's second but going to be third, I think Alonso's beating Leclerc because the Aston Martin was so much... It was, I think he did 13 seconds to Sainz um, by, from, from the point where Leclerc retired to the end of the race. Leclerc was 13 seconds up the road. So even as it was, it might have been close. Uh, and he lost so much time in the first half with the Mercedes. So the, the question for Aston Martin... A bit like Red Bull, where they flattered with Bahrain being the only circuit we've seen the cars at. And in the same way, probably they were. The high deg obviously favoured them and they were much stronger in the race than they were in quali. The other thing with Aston Martin that's interesting is they've got a huge amount more development time than everyone in that front pack. They've developed the car. They were the best developers what, last year. In terms year. of the, the regulations and yeah, the amount yeah, they've got Yeah, in terms to play of the with. regulations, they've, they, can, they can go deeper with their wind tunnel allowance and uh, and CFD, and they can f- explore for longer, basically, ways to improve their car um, just because of the, the way they were seventh in the constructors last year, so they've got loads of time. Um, and they've done a good job with it, development. Last year, they were the best team at development from race one to the final race, statistically. They've made a huge leap over the winter. They have Fernando Alonso, who's more motivated than he's been for a decade, so you wonder why maybe they can just be second throughout the whole year. I don't know if they can catch Red Bull, but maybe they can hold on. So that's one of the live questions this weekend, Aston Martin. And as ever coming to Saudi Arabia, Andrew, there's live questions about whether Formula One should be here. And the drivers inevitably were asked about that today in the press conference. Yes, and it's, I mean, normally these things are about human rights. It comes up every year in Saudi Arabia, in Bahrain and countries like that. But this year in Jeddah, it's, 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 it's more than that because if, if people remember last year's race was dominated by the uh, missile strike against an oil factory, uh, an oil refinery, sorry, uh, just 10 kilometres from the track on the, on the Friday, after which uh, the drivers had serious misgivings about going ahead with the race weekend. There were hours of meetings that night. Uh, it ran in gone way past midnight eventually they were taught that started off with the drivers not wanting to race um uh but they were talked down by the saudi authorities and the f1 bosses um and they were they since then they've been given reassurances that this weekend's safe um but it was very clear today during the press conferences that they were not happy or certainly not comfortable about being back in Saudi Arabia um they were asked about uh, the missile strike and were they happy were they uh, comfortable being racing in Saudi again. And Valtteri Bottas said he preferred not to answer the question. Yuki Tsunoda said the same. Alex Albon said the same. Um, then later in the second press conference, uh, Hamilton and Ocon and Magnussen were asked about it. And uh, Magnussen was like, none of us enjoyed that. Um, we go to these places. We just have to deal with it the best we can and get through it. Um, Hamilton initially didn't, didn't want to address it at all. Um, uh, but he did eventually say, look, when it's beholden upon us, when we come to these places that, um, uh, that we raise awareness, it's duty bound, we're duty bound to raise awareness and try to leave a positive impact. Uh, human rights groups are already, uh, contacting people like me and saying that, um, Saudi Arabia is, has executed 13 people in the last two weeks and that Formula One hasn't seriously engaged with human rights. Formula One's position is that by going to places like Saudi Arabia, it, it can uh, engender positive change. But that, that de- this debate's not going away anytime soon, as it is the same case for any sport that goes to Saudi Arabia. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, naturally, fingers crossed we get a safe weekend. Maybe it shouldn't need to be the case that it, we have to cross our fingers, but... There we go. That's uh, that's where we're at at the moment. And you can hear the Grand Prix on Five Live on uh, Sunday afternoon. Race gets underway at 5 p.m. in the UK on BBC Radio Five Live. We'll have every minute of practice and qualifying on the BBC Sport website and across uh, Sports Extra as well. 
And we'll be back with a podcast after qualifying on Saturday and a post-race podcast on Sunday. So we'll speak to you then. This has been an IMG production for BBC Radio 5 Live. Enjoy the Grand Prix this weekend.